PM Radio on the planet. Welcome to I'm Nature. I am your host, Brian Porter. And this evening we tackle probably the toughest environmental problem on the planet. And that is the leaking radiation, the radionuclides getting into the Pacific Ocean, into the atmosphere, into the soil, all over the planet, folks. This is going everywhere. That's the way this planet was designed. It's designed to spread everything everywhere because it used to be a pure place where the, not full of toxins. And it was designed that way. And so we have to realize that that's the case. So we have to find a way to stop this huge problem. Probably the most serious issue we've ever faced as a species is this leaking nonstop pariah of the planet called Fukushima. Now, to uh, discuss this issue, I have two of the top minds on the planet. We have Dana Dernford, uh, a guy who's uh, studied the after effects of Fukushima more than anybody I know. Big uh, kudos to him for his incredible uh, time and effort to basically detail the devastating effects of Fukushima, something that, that the mainstream media has just completely ignored uh, to the uh, demise of the planet. And I also have my friend James McKinney on, who started out in his education uh, with a master's in solid-state nuclear physics. So I believe he has something to add to this discussion along with all those all those other many, many areas of expertise. Um, so I really welcome both of these guys to the table. So folks, uh, Dana and James, are you ready to tackle this difficult subject? Going to yes. give it our best try. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, guys, for coming on. I mean, I, I'm one who likes to find solutions to every problem and whether or not, you know, they get implemented. I mean, that's not my problem. I, I can't force people to change, but I can certainly say, hey, this is a solution. But man, Fukushima is the toughie. But before we get to solutions, we'll save that for the second hour. I want to just get, because I'm not sure everybody listened to the first show I did with Dana Dernford. Uh, Dana, I have to tell you. That was the show of all the shows I did last year. It was my most popular show in the podcast. So congratulations, Danny. You put on a hell of a Good stuff. Show. Yeah, and I probably could have done a better job when I thought about the show after. I could have started <laughs> off by talking about Fukushima, what happened, blah, 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 <laughs> rather than just go down the horror show that I went down. Dana, but, you did an amazing job, honest to God. I mean, nobody has taken the time and put out the effort that you have to reveal no. this problem. <laughs> That gonna happen. I don't know if anybody. And I don't like to blow my own whistle in in the context of it. But when I look at what I accomplished, yeah, good luck on anybody trying to outdo me. <laughs> I, and I'm not even started yet. When you think about it, I'm just getting in second gear. Uh, because it's second gear all the way for me because of this accident. Once I got a grip on it and understood it and proved that it was definitively it was an issue. Uh, it was all in 24/7 after that, of course. And so I, I live, eat, breathe this stuff uh because i got i don't feel that there's no one out there that'll do the job properly and until that someone shows up um that that obligation is obviously on my shoulders to keep 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 active no matter even if it don't make any headway whatsoever i still have to keep pushing as hard as i can and learning in case i do get an opportunity to talk to this planet and because that's what we want got to do we got to have a talk a real talk uh, it's not going to go away. It's only going to get worse, and it's accumulating in everything and everybody. And so the effects are, are soon to be felt. Have they already been felt? But they're really going to show up hard uh, within this before the end of this year. My estimates will be no whales left on the coastline of British Columbia Pacific uh, Ocean uh, at all. And you know, if that happens, and I, I I'm looking at it happening, the implications are just extraordinary i wouldn't even know where to begin this cataclysmic it's like a meteorite coming at us in every sense of the word i've been saying that all along and it's just because it wasn't just fukushima prefectures uh, reactors that melted down it was other reactors along the coastline and james as you know once the reactor doesn't get power for an hour and a half two hours it all goes downhill really fast from there on and in Japan's case, they never got no, they couldn't get power because the tsunami took out hundreds of miles of the coastline. And there was 20,000 dead and hundreds of thousands in misery and stranded and impelled with all kinds of stuff from the tsunami. 
and just traumatized and, and you know, it, it, in every sense of the word, it looks like they they didn't even try to to deal with the power plants because they understood themselves what we are and just learning that there was no way to stop this. And so everybody ran and they left the skeleton crew allegedly behind, but even they ran uh, within a day and a half and abandoned the place. And then they were ordered back in by the prime minister at the time. Uh, but, you know, we don't see Harvard or Yale or Berkeley or Stanford or MIT or Oxford or any of the major uh, shakers and movers on the planet uh, at Fukushima. Are the scripts or the, scripts or the wood, uh, what is it, wood hole, uh, you know, right. um, uh, oceanography centers, they're, they're missing in, a, in action. Woods Hole Oceanographic mm -hmm. Institution, um, yeah. And so what they do is they take water samples offshore. I got arrested for harassing them and like a badge of honor. Uh, but I was smeared across Canada and the media as uh, uttering death threats. And so the death threats were about, um, we got to change the laws to hang these people in the future when, when we finally convict them. And so that was chopped out and then, the smear was put in there and I was smeared throughout the country, but I was charged with criminal harassment to the nuclear pukes and that was Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And what it was is just my frustration and indignant because they didn't look at the tidal zones, which is the most vulnerable where you're going to find the damage show up originally. As you look at the insect and the flan of the floor, I guess, um, and the microscopic world originally when there's these types of accidents. And then all the studies pre-Fukushima of the damage from Chernobyl done exactly that. And all those, all those science, all those institutions, Harvard, Yale, Berkeley, MIT, all of these guys, none of them went to Fukushima, but they all went to Chernobyl. And so that should tell people, you know, something right off the bat, how bad it truly actually is. And that, you know, they showed us number four. Number four was destroyed, but they rolled out a perfectly intact fuel pool and then the integrity of the interior of the building was was symmetrically beautiful and that's not possible when you look at the actual I have 5,000 pictures of the buildings and so right away I'm, I'm still the only person out there truly pounding away at that unit for hoax because that's how everybody fell asleep was on that hoax and now they admit that as some of the media anyway has admitted that number four was all gone and I provide links under my videos to the NRC's um, redacted emails. There's around 4 million of them. But right away, as soon as you start reading through them at their site, you'll see on March the 18th, as you go through that section, you'll see them repeatedly talking about number four spent fuel pool. Uh, Cough fire blew up, Cough fire blew up and disappeared. And it was all gone. And so that one alone is was what they were trying to perpetrate up on the planet and then ignore the three melted reactors themselves that were confirmed. and But they wouldn't, they didn't even put that up on their Wikipedia page from TEBCO until, um, not last year, the year before, uh, middle of 2014. And so it was just a total cluster the whole time where we couldn't find someone to tell us the truth. And so I ended up going through 9,000 headlines, live streamed that out there uh, over a year's period before I even went on the ocean to verify and prove it and flush it out properly, and then we went on these expeditions for uh, 260 days out of a 12-month period, 15,000 miles, 200,000 pictures, and we, we went and categorized the entire species along the coastline. Now, what was really staggering about that, not it, was bad, it wasn't bad enough that all the species were missing in the tidal zones. Now, that's around 5,600 residential. Uh, but, I mean, certain parts of the coastline could have, say, 1,800 more of uh, those species in Berkeley Sound, for instance, is recognized in study after study. Uh, and so having all of them disappeared and then being a vilified as the bad guy for going out and documenting that has been quite a roller coaster for me. But what it showed us was that the other 4 million species also were gone also because they didn't recede that coastline. And because every millimeter of that coastline was jostling for life, and was already, you know, spoken for over millenniums of genetic superior selection, filling up that void and dominating it. That was the indigenous residential species. Now we're all gone. So when I went ashore, I'll end it on that and let you guys talk. When I went ashore every day and took a bath in the rivers and the estuaries, I would take a walk up into the woods with my dog. 
and I never ran into spider webs. And I never really noticed that for the first couple of weeks. I couldn't kind of wrap my mind around it. And then it struck me really odd. And when I was looking at the pictures, I was like, okay, I got to go back in now specifically and start looking for spider webs. And so I started looking really hard. I started finding maybe one or two every three or four days, but they were deformed. Uh, but then it struck me, wait a second, there's, I don't hear any birds. And so we went up and camped on these islands for eight days looking for the insects in Pacific. But we also went out and done the low tide zone, each low tide. And uh, we left our tents open and everything. I mean, incredible, in the middle of nowhere. We left food on our table. We brought these little fold-up tables with us. And we would go out in the Zodiacs all day long, come back, and the food's still sitting there. All night long, food's still sitting there. And our original instinct when we went ashore was to hide our food up high and stuff like that. Uh, and so that really told a story. And then I'd done one more expedition. And that expedition was all the west coast of Canada on the outside open ocean. So every 20 miles of the coastline. And that was a really, really tough one. And uh, it was the same thing. Now I really concentrated in on the insects and uh, every chance I got when I wasn't on the ocean. And so now we know for sure that the birds were missing, not only from the migratory and residential bird saltwater animals that you were familiar with. And there's around 168 residential birds throughout British Columbia and around 149 res uh, migratory birds that we recognize as normal every year and have a, a pattern here. They, they were missing. We only counted uh, 11 species altogether in 260 days. And uh, one trip, uh, the last trip all the way up to Alaska and then came down the west side of Canada all the way to the other end of Canada. That trip up there, I counted 400 birds altogether. Now, if anybody's not familiar with what that means is that every square mile on the ocean uh, would normally have 1,000 to 5,000 birds. This is what I'm familiar with. And so to see 400 birds from one end of Canada to the other end of Canada, most of these were around communities. And uh, that's where you would find birds right now. It's around the communities. They're uh, coexisting with the community. They're, like, there is fish out here. Uh, people are still catching fish. Uh, but fish are way up the food chain. They're consuming each other. Same as the beers. Uh, never had no salmon this year. They didn't have any trout this year because all the ice is missing from the mountains in British Columbia. And so I'm flipping all over the place. We'll come back to that maybe in a minute. Let you guys do some interjection on some of that because I can go for two hours, trust me, and I don't want to do that to you. with take up your time. Um, um, go ahead, James, uh, exactly. Yeah, let me just interject a few things here. From Fukushima, the uh, initial radiation from was from an explosion. And uh, I am personally of the opinion that it was not the tsunami that caused the reactor to blow. That's another topic. That they, they were actually blown by a terrorist activity from Israel, who was mad at Japan because Japan had been selling spent nuclear fuel to Iran for Iran's uh, nuclear fuel program. Uh, that's another story. But once the reactor, I think it was, it was number three or four, that blew up, um, <clears throat> then the heat from that uh, started a chain reaction on the other three, re the other two reactors that actually uh, uh, had fire damage, and then there was a fourth one that had some fire. Uh, there's a total of six reactors, um, but the end result is that one of the reactors went critical, which means they were not able to shut it down, contrary to reports. And uh, it's still uh, reacting there. Japan is dumping, uh, I forget how much water on that per day to keep it from, uh, from the other two from actually melting down. And all of that water is going into the ocean. They don't have any containment there. There was, uh, I forget, 300 or 460,000 tons of coolant water that has been leaching into the ocean, and this is highly contaminated. There are over 2,000 species of contaminants from the reactors. The tracers that we use are the strontium, the iodine, and the, um, uh, the um, uh, cesium-137. So it's the, uh, 
the strontium-90, the iodine-131, and the cesium-137. And, and if you remember, for, for example, Chernobyl, they talked a lot about the, the strontium-90, um, but those are the tracers. Uh, also, it's the uh, cesium that is very, the cesium and strontium are very bad in that they, uh, we usually think of radioactivity and long-term cancer, things like that, but the strontium and the cesium are very short-term. If they get into your heart or into your vascular system in a mammal, they will kill you in a couple of days at most. Uh, and so they, uh, you know, we sometimes think about the phytoplankton absorbing the radiation and it going up the food chain. But the other, these uh, highly reactive elements will kill mammals and fish like right now. So they don't even wait uh, for the food chain to take its effect. But uh, the, um, the, a very small amount of this goes a long way. The, uh, there's a, a, an enormous corruption in science. One of the most corrupt areas of science is in nuclear physics and in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the International, um, the IAAC, it's the, um, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is basically complicit like the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States or the Atomic Energy Commission in the United States or the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, the, these organizations, agencies, are all complicit. The United Nations has a nuclear regulatory agency in, with, internally. These are all uh, complicit in covering up this accident. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the end result is it, it does appear, and this is from multiple sources, and of course, Dana, you've been there on site to report exactly what's going on. And the, uh, I'll just say this, a blanket statement, within the scientific community, it is so corrupt in the dishonesty within the scientific community, whether they're uh, peer-reviewed, uh, tenured professors in a, in working for an, uh, in the institute like Scripps, um, or if they're working for a university system, they are so corrupted and so dishonest uh, that uh, you can't even begin to, to uh, discuss this on a rational level. And it's all controlled from the very top. The, Japan started up 48 of its nuclear reactors. They have, uh, regarding Fukushima, they have done nothing. They've poured water on it that drains into the ocean. Uh, their current status is they're waiting for the first three years to expire while they have panels study this. And the, they don't plan on doing anything regarding containment for the first six years. And they think this is good because Three Mile Island took something like uh, 30 years to actually decommission. Uh, Chernobyl, the process is still going on. Anyway, uh, I think the biggest story here is the vast corruption internationally in the nuclear regulatory agencies. Hey, um, Chernobyl or Three Mile Island lasted five days, uh, the chain reaction itself. And so that was a pretty big release and then it stopped kind of like Chernobyl lasted 10 days and then it stopped. It was equal to 400 Hiroshima bombs. And you still can't eat the meat or drink the milk or sell the land in parts of Ireland, Scotland, UK. And Sweden just opened a fishery over there two years ago uh, for freshwater fishery after 26 years closure because of Chernobyl. But once again, Chernobyl stopped after 10 days. And But it was just because it was... It was uh, now, Fukushima didn't stop. And a good example of looking at Fukushima in comparison, I think, for everybody is you got four buildings four buildings. So I want everybody to think about four 10-story buildings in their community or a community they're familiar with, four 10-story buildings. Not 20-story, but 10-story buildings. Now, think about you got a contract to take garbage out of those buildings, and your your job is now to take out 9 million, I'm not kidding, folks, 9 million one-ton one um, 
rubber bags of garbage out of four buildings. Now, you would think that there have to be an assembly line on the other side of the building hit away filling the building up with this stuff. But that was just from Fukushima Prefecture that cleaned up nine, it got nine million bags, one ton bags from four buildings. And so it kind of defies any kind of rationality where it creates so much. Now, that's because it's mixed with garbage, it's mixed with wood, it's mixed with uh, leaves and everything else. It's, de- it's what they call decontamination. But you can take these isotopes and put them in battery acid. You still can't kill them. Uh, and so those reactors have never stopped. But th- if they were to clean up all of Japan, you'd probably be looking at five or six uh, billion bags, one-ton bags. But that will never stop coming out of there. And you'll have to do that like a perpetual motion machine until the chain reaction finally stops down there is what it is appearing to be happening. Because once again, you don't see any of the institutions <laughs> going, going in there. Now, just to back up what you were saying is that you have Chernobyl where they're still trying to deal with it. The reason they got that sarcophagus over Chernobyl, not that it's a perfect sarcophagus, and you can't do that because of the noble gases anyway, but because everything is vented, of course, and that's another one of the big lies. And just to cover one more time what James was talking about where the academics themselves have betrayed uh, science itself. Now, I got study after study after study after study. Did, folks, these are peer-reviewed by other institutions. And what they done was they told you about a man-made radionuclide, but then they told you that a natural radionuclide, there was more of that. And therefore, thank goodness, there was, you know, it wasn't as much as it was natural. But that, and it was just kind of a slippery, it's not even a slippery slope, it's an outrageous, outright, flat-in-your-face lie but yet it was peer-reviewed by other institutions. And that law then was published in a, in a by a... So there's three big uh, publishers on the planet, Elsewhere, Springer, and Wiley. And they get the studies uh, from our universities and institutions that are sponsored and paid for by taxes for free. And other institutions will do all the work, and we pay for all of that, of course. We pay for the, the academics... We pay for the institutions. We we burn thirty five billion a year here in Canada, and you know it gets locked up behind three major publishers' paywalls. It's really shocking. So it's really hard to to get access to all the information. And James, as you know, like when you're at an institution, they got a library that they paid for, and if you want something extra, you got to pay for it basically, or you might get lucky. But generally, you got to pay for everything else. You you don't have access the 22,000 publishers from elsewhere and Springer and Wally, you get a package. And so the packages that are, are basically free are full of those lies. And so the, the students that are going to the institutions are being updated with these fake and, and really uh, horrible studies that are actually not, they were meant to indoctrinate the kids to the point of they get a little older, a little mature, and then they buy into the industry. I'm not saying everybody is bad, but I'm just saying there's a large majority will buy into that. And so that's why we're kind of into the trouble that we are, because the industry would have never made it this far if people knew it wasn't like a banana or a potato chip or walking in sunshine or getting on an airplane. And that when you ingest a man-made ionized radioactive um, atom, then you got 1,800 autoimmune deficiencies will show up before the cancer does. And cancer takes 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years to manifest and get diagnosed. And then it's hard to say, I drove past a nuclear power plant and they had a release that day, but they didn't admit it and I sucked some of it in. Or that I lived in that environment for a couple of weeks visiting friends and I was outdoors when the wind was blowing that way. Or that you drank the water in the local area that was contaminated or who knows, or ate a fish that was contaminated. So it's very difficult or near impossible, or not near, but it's impossible to trace it back to the nuclear industry. And they rely upon that as a way. But when you look at the natural tritium levels pre-Fukushima in particular throughout the whole planet, that's what I've been doing all day was gathering them up. You might see at tops, say, eight beckles a decimeter, 100 liters. Um, uh, but now you can see in Canada, we have 7,000 beckles of tritium per liter. And I was talking about man-made before, and this is man-made we're talking about again. And so Canada was the same thing as any other country where you might get eight beckles, say, per cubic meter, 1,000 liters. Canada now has a drinking water standard 
of 7 million barrels in a cubic meter, 7,000 in a liter. And a cubic meter is basically your hot tub, folks. Uh, but that's considered a standard throughout the country now. And we think that's accurate because all the snow has gone from the mountains in British Columbia. And so the beers, like I was talking about earlier, my kid had to put down a beer uh, a month ago, a little over a month ago, when he was taking guides. He takes people up, uh, researchers up these uh, estuaries and rivers. And at that time they were doing uh, salmon counts. They had done it about four weeks in a row with the same researchers. He carries a gun. And he's also a skipper. He has the tickets, and he takes fisheries and oceans and other researchers out on the ocean for their research. And he's the he'll they'll get the boat and they'll hire him to be the skipper, the guide also. And so he had to put down a beer. The beer was skinny. Uh, the beer was in the river. There was no salmon up that river. And the biologists uh, a couple of weeks ago, I I was told those biologists were saying the salmon spawned out at the bottom of the river because the ice was all gone. There was no water to get up that river. It was a dry season on top of that. Now, that ice normally took 1,000, 10,000 years to get into the mountains, and it's all gone, so it'll take 1,000 to 10,000 years to come back. And so that's why all the trout died off. So the salmon and the trout disappeared. The uh, animals didn't have anything to eat. And so their scat was full of apples because the berries also failed. The berries, berries were dependent upon all that water coming down through the mountains and feeding the roots. And so that all failed along the coastline symmetrically. And But we've seen a lot of stories like this now where the animals are all emaciated. And that still seems to be the big uh, theme for all the mammals in the ocean. They're all emaciated. And that's because the krill is now gone. The um, anchovies have disappeared three years in a row. The sardines have failed three years in a row. The herring have flopped three years in a, go, in a row, rather. And all these important uh, bio... Um, well, they convert krill into uh, energy that we consume basically and mammals would consume and migratory animals are dependent upon the birds are dependent upon and so that's why all the migratory and the birds and the animals have all disappeared uh, since last year basically the ones that we do find is mass die-offs and they're emaciated every almost every single time that has been reported whether the rest were or not, we don't know. But almost every single time that was reported that the animals and the birds had starved to death or was emaciated. And we know 10,000 seals, baby seals and sea lions. Now, what happens with them is they're dependent upon krill when they're really young and herring for their diets. Uh, and they were so emaciated, their next line of defense was to go ashore into the tidal zones on the coastline or even where they're too normally. And what they would do is they would... They would suck the nutrients off the rocks. They would suck the 600 algae off the rocks, the 70 sponges, the 76 species of sea anemones. They would eat all the shellfish, the abalone, the scallops, the, the little necks, the manila clams, the razorback clams, uh, and all the gooseneck barnacles and everything else, the mollusks. Uh, just this wealth that was in the tidal zone is all missing. And so they were found dead. The autopsy showed they had naked, empty rocks in their stomachs. And so they were eating the rocks, and normally they would do that in hard times. And there have been hard times throughout our history, but nothing like what we see now. And we have never seen an extinction event wipe out the species of the entire Pacific Rim coastline in British Columbia. Dave, I have to, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to throw a question in here in terms of uh, uh, the algae. Is the algae all gone too? So there's about 100 species left on the coastline, and around 24 of those were algaes. And uh, there was around five species of starfish. There was um, four species of sea anemones out of 76 species. There were 78 species, 79 species of starfish. These all come in multiple colors, each species, by the way, folks. So one species, for instance, uh, leatherback starfish up in the Queen Charlotte's, uh, they could exist, and they do. They're being recorded over and over and over at 70 or 75 per square meter. Uh, I was up and documented those whole areas. There was none per square meter. And so that was shocking. And people travel, used to travel all over the world pre-Fukushima to see those sites. Uh, and then there's 480 species of worms. And I never seen any species or casings in the tidal zones. And uh, I, that's a lie. I did find a couple of casings one time. And I got good documentation pictures of that. I took over 200,000 pictures and an obscene amount of underwater footage. Now, what was really interesting was that underwater, uh, throughout this uh, 
these islands, there's 26,000 islands up here, and I spent 260 days there. What I discovered under the underwater footage was that the beaches that are made of shellfish, of shells, right? Uh, there was no shellfish on the beaches or below the beaches in the water. And so if people aren't familiar with what I mean by that is when you go underwater around these beaches that are, are shellfish, what we call shell, a little tongue twister fish beaches, you would look underwater and as you're coming to the shoreline in your boat, you would see all these white shells. They stand out distinctly, even in muddy water. And you know you're in shallow water and you start tilting your engine up. It's a reflex for anybody who spent a lot of time on the ocean. But that's what you're looking for anyway. And white sea, giant plume sea anemones is another one. Normally you see about 500 per square meter. And so you can chop them up into 500 pieces, each one of them. And that's 500 more because they'll just reseed the coastline. And that's what happens in storms where the rocks are flipped over. They get busted up and they reseed the coastline. They were missing throughout the coastline too. But also all the shellfish, the abalone and the scallops and the, and, um, the mussels and the invertebrates and the beak clams, the great big clams that are just in indicative of British Columbia everywhere you go was missing from underwater and so that's very distinct in the footage a very shocking thing in the footage and we know that if you start wiping out the starfish for instance the sea urchins they're the same family but they all start filling up that gap and we know that in 2015 the Smithsonian and National Geographic came out with articles saying that the uh, researchers have recorded four spots where the sea urchins were in sharp decline and, and a fifth spot off Baja, California in America. And because of those five spots, they, they declared a mass mortality event for sea urchins. Now, I went and went through the entire coastline and showed everything was missing and that the four million plus million other species didn't receive the coastline and weren't visibly found anywhere uh, amongst everything else that I showed. Uh, and I never, I got arrested <laughs> as soon as I got back. Uh, and attacked and demonized and vilified and smeared in the media, which is once again is a badge of honor. <coughs> that was Dana Zoe. <coughs> that was Dana. I'm sorry. And so, that's my dog. She's 15 years old. She traveled the coastline with me. It's okay. You're okay. And so the birds were gone. The mammals were gone. I think I counted all together 19 whales. Now, normally along the coastline of British Columbia every year, there's around eight or even North America, there's around eight whales will be found. There's probably more than that, no doubt, that died that we didn't find, but we find around eight is the average each year. And we, we look for them in planes and helicopters. The local pilots will keep an eye out for stuff like that, and that really stands out heavily. Uh, this year we have over uh, 42 already recorded from last year, rather, I'm sorry, 2015. Uh, but then again, I was on that coastline for a long time, and I didn't see much traffic. It was a shocking uh, little traffic. And I hung out with the only fleet that was really working the coastline for a couple of months. And that was the commercial diving fleet. I used them as a platform for water and fuel. And I surveyed the coastline where they were diving offshore. And we swapped stories. And I, and I, I was an ex-commercial diver. So many of these uh, veterans were very close friends of mine. And some of the stuff they told me was shocking. And I mean, right away, first thing they admitted to me, because they hadn't seen me for 15 years, and, and so it was good times. And then they tried to figure out what the hell I was doing, and uh, I didn't want to tell that story for a couple of days to tell you the truth. But of course, how could you not? Uh, and they admitted to me readily, right away, the differences. They uh, really overwhelmed me. For instance, uh, right away, divers admitted and agreed when one diver in particular had said it, was that he's seen a lot more fish with tumors on it than he's ever seen in his entire life this year combined. Uh, was shocking. And then the other divers spoke up. But we've seen uh, the divers come up to me sometimes and would report mass die-offs on the, on the ocean floor of, say, starfish, where there was nothing but legs everywhere, no bodies. And it was the most bizarre, most bizarre thing imaginable for these guys. But, uh, I mean, they live in the environment, and they're, they're, they see it happening in increments over years, and it doesn't really dawn onto them until somebody raises the subject. And, of course, me just being there was salacious anyway, when you think about it. And so that's the problem. See, I look at it, and that was the problem, where everything that they took out of the ocean, to me, somebody might eat it. And then you might give them cancer in 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And sometimes they would say stuff like, well, at least it's going back to Japan. And I would say, you know, hang my head. 
because my friend had said that. Uh, but I get where they're coming from where people can't wrap their mind around it, can't understand it, and don't have the patience to, on, to try to hunt down the data. And when they do, they run into the old ticker tape of it's like a banana, it's like a potato chip, or it's like walking in the sunshine. And so you're stonewalled all the time trying to have a conversation. You can't have a debate. But the divers, by the time it was all said and done, the majority of them uh, had come up and shook my hand and encouraged me to keep up my research really understood what I was going, where I was going with it and why they weren't happy and they were devastated in every sense of that word. And there was some heated moments because some of them felt that they couldn't do their job with me in the fleet at the end of it. Uh, but these were newcomers. But, I mean, they were. we got into fights uh, and I had to stand my ground a number of times. And then once I, I hit them with the information, they never had nowhere to go. Of course, you know, these people are focusing on one species. So when you ask them how many species of worms there are, and they say, what are you talking about? And say, so, well, there's 480. How many species of sea anemones are there? And they say, there's 10. You say, there's 78. And so as you go down that list, they start to realize that they don't know Jack. Uh, that's a way of putting it, I suppose. But they don't actually understand, even though they work in that environment. Because I worked in the environment. I know what it's like. It's tunnel vision. You're there to do a job. And you do, you do look around you, but you can't take it in your focus 100% on getting back on that boat at the end of the day. That's two marathons on the human body every day. And I used to do it 315 days a year. And I've done it in boat, boat oceans. I dove under the ice for five years on top of that. And so I have, but I worked every industry in boat oceans on top of that. But nuclear was a um, hobby for me. And I have over 7,000 lectures in it. From way back before Fukushima. Yeah, you, uh, yeah, Dana, you used to focus your initial uh, energy, a lot of it, on uh, depleted uranium use, right? Right. Yeah, I have a bone to pick with that one. And so, I mean, they were firing 5.5 million rounds a month in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so, me, this is unacceptable that uh, to, to, to go catch 10,000 bad guys, we're going to fire 5.5 million rounds a month. I can't wrap my mind around it. And a bomb a minute, 1,440 minutes in a day for nine years. But when you start looking at the stats, you've got 22 veterans committing suicide every day. That's 80,000 in a decade, roughly. You've got a 29,000 rapes in the military uh, that's admitted now every year. So that's 290,000 rapes of their own. And 80,000 suicides to get 10,000 bad guys. But then you look at the carnage they've done down there. You've got millions dead, millions missing, millions in refugee camps, millions of orphans in Afghanistan, and 5.5 million rounds a month and bomb a minute. And then they went over and done the same thing to Iraq. And then who won the war down there? Well, it was Monsanto in both of those countries because they weren't allowed to grow their indigenous plants for the next 20 years after the war. And Monsanto was the only seed they were allowed to grow. And so you just see this, this uh, unbalance uh, and just maniacal system that goes into Yemen and Somalia and in Syria and Libya and everywhere else looking for the same 10,000 gangbangers. And then they go over into uh, India and Pakistan where they fire uh, 22,000 drone strikes. And each one of these strikes are devastating to get uh, what's left of the 10,000 Taliban. And, and then we see that there's... 700 million people groped at the airports every year with the borders wide open in America to get whatever's left of these 10,000 Taliban. You really got to start shaking your head and wondering. I mean, these are my statistics that I gathered up. And when I, you know, when I go through it like that, there's nobody I've ever talked to face to face uh, was able to stand their ground after that because yeah, I know yeah, I know what. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, yeah, I just want to, just in terms of a ballpark number, how many uh, how many million tons of depleted uranium has been dumped in the Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan? They got two billion tons. They want to get rid of Americans. We don't know about Russia and China and Israel. But you have, a, Canada, you have an estimate number of how much? No, I don't know. Damage we've done. We know that. We know that. Look, you can look at it this way: five point five million rounds a month. A lot of that was coming from McAllister's bomb manufacturer, McAllister, Oklahoma. They only produce depleted uranium, dirty bombs. But the A-10 Warthog shoots a ton and a half of uh, uranium-238 a minute. That's with the extra electrons. And now, uh, Japanese physicist at a Hamburg conference had estimated 700 tons was the animosity equivalent of uh, 44,000 Nagasaki bombs worth. Uh, we know they used that uh, A-10 Warthog could shoot through that in no time at all, and did many times. But they were using it, uh, the Abrams tank was, uh, they were firing like a bomb a minute. Uh, and so D-1 
these are 10 pounds of uranium-238. It's not tipped. It's not coated. Uh, and it's pyroplastic. As it goes through the air, it's catching fire, and it's atomizing and aerosoling, and it's distributing it throughout the environment. This is why I got so upset. I always get upset when I talk about it. But this is why I got so upset because my visuals – See, I, I see things in I see things in colors, uh, but I see structure. And I, every time I seen that one, I would always see kids uh, picking up toys and shaking blankets and stuff like that. And that would just like really, I would get angry over it. But it's a very visual thing I have with with all of this. That's why I am like I am, I guess. And so I started looking at it really heavily, and I was shocked to see the studies on on uh, animals and humans that are back into the 40s and 50s and 60s that are well known now. Many people that have searched, researched this would have known that kind of stuff. Uh, and I've I become just totally, uh, how would you put it, totally disconnected. And I've become focused in on just learning that. And I spent years and years and years just trying to study it and understand it. And because of so many lawyers and the academics, I got fooled over and over and over and then had to throw away everything after a number of years and start off again and relearn everything again because I realized I had I had fell for the old banana potato chip walk in sunshine to the point where I couldn't excuse myself anymore and I had to relearn everything. And so that process taught me that I was right in that I had an anger. I just didn't understand why. The anger was because they were lying to me, but it was done so sweet and so simple and I couldn't understand it because I put my trust in them. And that's what got my back up in the air and finally got me to settle down and really put my head to work on it. And, you know, one good thing about the Internet, if you lie or misrepresent or misconstrue anything, the Internet will rip you to pieces in minutes. In minutes, if not hours, you're done, and you can wreck your name in no time at all, right? Now, I make simple mistakes, and because I talk, uh, do a lot of presentations, an amazing amount of interviews and everything else, Sometimes when I listen to them, I might say three million instead of three billion, or I might say three instead of three million, you know. And so I make, I know I make simple mistakes. And I, and when I, and I tell my listeners, if I make a mistake, and I used to do this all the time, I don't do it as much anymore, but I would always tell the listeners, if I make a mistake, tell me, because that will make me stronger. That'll make me better. That'll make me more. Dina, if you if you do anything, you offer so much information. It's hard to ingest it all because you right. throw it out. You're kind of like a like a like a a, a a decomposing atom. I mean, it just comes at you like bang, 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 bang. Let's get back to this depleted uranium use. All right, so you. I've been saying this for a long time. Basically, what they've done in the Middle East is is had a nuclear war there. Right. Right. Yeah. That's right, Joe. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to mention too, um, Brian and yeah, Dana, um, that the uh, the nuclear reactors that they're uh, uh, that are in use today were never meant to burn the fuel that's being burned in them. Uh, it was a lower grade fuel, didn't require the cooling uh, after the after the spent uh, the fuel rods were spent. But basically what they're doing today is they're taking nuclear warheads, they're decommissioning them, uh, converting it into the fuel rods. This is a big business. And uh, all over the world, that's what's being used for nuclear fuel in uh, nuclear reactors for electrical energy. And so when Fukushima melted down, it's the equivalent of having a nuclear war. Uh, so uh, That's a great point. Keep going, James. Thank you. Yeah, this is, and then let's talk a little bit about the so-called cleanup. There is no way that you can clean this stuff up because uh, to to truly clean it up, you would have to separate it out into its uh, its its atomic forms again, the strontium and the iodine, etc. And get it mainly. It's in dirt. It's in. It's combined with other uh, larger organic molecules, etc. And, and you, so there's, there's a myth that somehow we're going to clean this up. Uh, there's no such thing as cleaning it up. There's no such thing as converting these atoms into something else. Uh, right. there, this is nuclear. This so, is not a chemical reaction. James, so can, you, can you tell us ahead. about, can you tell us, um, what's the cleanup protocol for a nuclear contaminated site maybe? If you find uh, like if you find a dirty bomb somewhere and it exploded, how would you go in and clean it up? I wonder. Any. 
Well, can, what can you, can you do is you, you okay, there's uh, the contamination is spread outwards. And in this case, uh, when the one reactor blew, it blew it all over Japan and all over the ocean. That was the first wave of radioactive contamination. Uh, but the, the, it's kind of exponential. As you get out farther, um, the contamination gets less. So the estimate is that at Chernobyl, uh, there was a 26,000 square kilometer area that had been contaminated. And so what did they do? That was big enough. It was in the middle of nowhere. So they just zoned it off. The problem with Fukushima is it's right next to the ocean and uh, they're still dumping water on to cool it down and all that water is going into the ocean. So it's just untold amounts of contaminants are washing into the ocean and have been since the so-called accident in 2011. Um, but uh, there's, no, there's no such thing as cleaning up a site. There's no such thing as storing nuclear waste. Uh, right, no because you have to vent it, right? Go ahead, I'm well, sorry, James. You have to cool it. Yeah, uh, on top of that, yeah. Yeah, so there's... Forever and, and there's, ever. It'll, it, it'll cause the casks that it's in uh, to become brittle and start on top leaking. Of that, right. Is that the Wigner effect, if I'm pronouncing that properly? Oh, I forget. I yeah, forget right. Off. I think it's a Wigner with a W. But don't take my word for it, folks. Something like that. It's an effect, uh, right, James, where... Uh, material absorb it's like a um, screwdriver and you put it on the battery of your car for a few minutes and you put a little electric charge and now it's like a little magnet and so material that's around nuclear becomes kind of like that in one sense is that right james is that a good way of looking at it i wonder well yeah the the uh, the neutron flux destroys materials <laughs> it's just it it's, becomes radiated and is able to put off emissions themselves, right? Is that it, yeah? It destroys the material if it's steel or if it's uh, plastic. On top of that, or, it breaks down whatever. the integrity of it and becomes, like yeah. you said, brittle is a a good way to look at it. Yeah, that's just a term that's used, but it destroys the material, and it, so it, right. There's there's no such thing as cleaning up a nuclear waste, and what you do uh, is you try and contain it. Uh, so that it doesn't spread anymore. Uh, something that happened at Chernobyl, just to give you an idea of the corruption involved, uh, the the Russians, uh, I th it was a group from Spain that came in, and they were they had welders literally cutting up the steel from the grid work of the uh, containment chamber at, at Chernobyl. They were supposed to take that and uh, put it in a spot and contain it, Instead, the Spanish took it over, and they were smelting it in Spain. And up in the Pyrenees Mountains on the French side, the French were detecting all of this Chernobyl radiation, but the wind up there in the Pyrenees comes from the west. Chernobyl is to the east. So they're going, how come we're getting all of this radiation? So they start tracing it backwards. They come down to a smelting plant in Spain, where they had shipped all of this steel from Russia and they were smelting it down to reuse. See, that's, a, steel. that's brilliant. Thank you, James. Uh, but, keep, but this is the level of corruption that, I mean, uh, we just find internationally. And, and there's nobody... Frying pans uh, and bumpers on cars have been made from this stuff, folks, if you're not familiar. Go ahead, James. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, those are examples. The case of Fukushima, it is like they had... Uh, probably uh, a major nuclear war in Japan. And right, and that's. Yeah. I'm just going to cut you off for one second. Just reinforce sure. what you were you were saying. You were talking about where they reclaimed plutonium uranium from the missiles that were already gone through a chain reaction, already unstable, and and that that stuff is much different reaction the way it is because when it goes through a chain reaction, it's considered about two million times worse than what it was originally. Like, you can probably handle it before it goes through a chain reaction. But once it goes through a chain reaction, Gunnarsson was saying that uh, to 1,500 um, chiropractors, that if he had a pound, he would kill everybody in the front row in one minute and everybody in the back row in, in less than 20 minutes. And that one pound can exterminate basically everything on this planet if you can get them into that room. And so because that, uh, he was basically talking about because it went through a chain reaction, now it's really, really... Is putting off the gamma shines and X-rays and and is splitting the atom itself, 
And that kind of material is what I'm basically saying, folks, is what James is talking about. And that a gram of this produces more atoms in every grain of sand on every beach on the planet. And so distributing it out, you can get everybody cancer. Now, if you just took a gram and you blew it up and it distributed, was able to distribute it over a country, you effectively, in, in many ways, have contaminated the country. It takes a long time for those effects to show up. But what James is talking about, folks, is that each of the reactors and the fuel pools where the reactors were stored after, above it, where they lost their inventories. And then I cut James off. We'll let you go again, James. I just wanted to clarify for people. Well, yeah. How, so much, how much material is that? You said a pound uh, well, well distributed could kill everyone. How many tons was aerosolized well, there, and lost? The reactors hold 3,450 assemblies. Each assembly has 80 rods. Each rod is around 18 pounds and 12 feet long. And so it's around a little over 5 million pounds per reactor. And Five so that's running. Pounds. Yeah, per reactor. And so if it was just the three reactors themselves, they were at full capacity. If it was just three reactors, that's 15 million pounds. But uh, they take that out every couple of years and put it up on the roof in the pool to cool down or the common spent pool that is on the ground. Now, the tsunami ran through this place and that was destroyed. But these buildings, they blew up and caught fire and blew up and caught fire until that was gone too. And now they finally admitted it. And so go back to James talking about um, how you can't clean it, clean it up anyway, even if you tried. And all they were doing was basically taking three or four inches of the topsoil and trying to make it sustainable for somebody for a little while. Because every time it rains, it fills up again. And every time it snows, it gets washed all around and everything else. Go ahead, James. I'll shut up for a minute. Uh, yeah, well, the the other thing at Fukushima is uh, they had 600,000 spent fuel rods that were on the roofs. And they have to cool these, so their solution was to put them on the uh, roof of the... Welcome back to I'm Nature. I'm your host, Brian Porter. And it's usually this time in my show when I, I uh, do my bit to support the station. It, it's uh, freedomslips.com. Revolution Radio has 90 different hosts. We're all out there trying to do our bit uh, to uh, improve this planet, to improve the world, to help you personally. And, and uh, my show mainly is focused on helping the planet because we sort of all depend on the planet to exist here, folks. Uh, we kind of got things backwards. But um, anyways, so I, I recommend that people get the archives. Uh, you've heard this a few times already, but I still say it's a great source of information. You can download it at your convenience. And everyone who's listening to my program, it's worth five bucks out of your pocket a month to subscribe. So get into the archives. There's all sorts of other things like seeds and whatnot, which are great ideas too. But the archives to me are the best bet. So now the other thing I want to let you know is that I have a new show after the show. It's called I Am Nature Extended, where we get to chat about the topics of the, of the day. And if you want to introduce new ones, you can. Yeah, so if you want to get into that show... Give me a, a Skype at B Porter P O R T E R five six one one B Porter five six one one. If you're not a friend already, I'll accept you as a friend, and we'll get you into that show. Okay, all right. Because I'm trying to create more activists, folks. As we're listening to this discussion today, I mean, this is the toughest of the toughest. I mean, there isn't any problem more difficult to solve than Fukushima. Believe me. I think both of my guests will agree to that uh, summation of what we're talking about. Yep. I mean, hey, um, we, we should try to look at some of the solutions. I don't know if James got a list here he want to get started with. Or... Yeah, well, I'll um, spend the second part of the show talking about some of the... Uh, some of the solutions, and I just just a couple of days ago, I discovered this document. Now, you went to this conference in 2014 in the U.S. I forget where it was, somewhere in the south. You were one of the guest speakers. Uh, there was a guy in there by Vepperman. Did you meet him, Gary Vepperman? You're talking to James? or No, I'm talking to you, Dana. No, I didn't meet him, no. Um, uh, James, what was his name again? Vepperman. No. Gary Vepperman. I sent him an email. I spoke, I believe it was his wife. <laughs> Are you talking about that symposium in Texas? I think it was maybe down south. I, yeah, Texas. Yeah, that one was Skype. Um, I did watch him, though, if I remember correctly, because he does sound familiar. I know he was there that day. 
everybody's deer was a PH and had books and all kinds of, uh, they were talking about Fukushima. That was with George Butler. And George, uh, I'd done his show on Christmas Eve for Boxing Day. He wanted to give everybody a wake-up call for the new year. And he called me up. I said, George, you sure you want to do that to people on Christmas Eve? <laughs> <laughs> because you got, I live just 24 hours a day. Well, so why don't was, you, uh, Dana, because you haven't really talked about your show. Like Dana's got an awesome new show that he does every day on live stream. Maybe you should talk again point. about for people who, who really want, I, I believe everyone listening to this show. I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. you got to listen to Dana's show at least once a week. It's only yeah. an hour long show. What? Well, tell them how to get there, Dana. Um, you, it's at uh, livestream.com. Uh, the live shows are. You don't have to catch the lives. They're archived there for your folks. And I also reposted that beautiful girl boy, Dana, on YouTube uh, a couple hours later. It takes about two hours. I'll upload it in a much higher quality. And the uh, equipment that I use, I can, I can, uh, up, I can live stream in one quality and record in another quality. And so that really is really good for people because we know we'll get a, a high quality up there, even though you limit it by bandwidth, as you know, right, how that works. Uh, I can actually record four or 4,000K cameras with the equipment I got. And that's for the documentary that I'm producing. And, but I'm, I've been at this a long time, so I use green screens for anybody who's not familiar with what I'm doing. And I incorporate the virtual sets and virtual TVs and virtual studios and i use professional it's professional gear so it's very 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 high quality even if it's streaming on a low bandwidth it's still super high quality audio uh and but i do provide all the documentation as i talk and so that's why i kind of i can go and go and go it's because i got everything loaded <laughs> and i know where it's too i have twenty five thousand supporting documentations on fukushima i have thousands of studies on radiation I have 5,000 pictures, and a lot of this is archived at uh, nuclearproctologist.org's website. And so when you go there, that's where most of the pictures are, but at the bottom of the pages, and there are lots of sections there just on headlines and sections on pictures about Fukushima, and these are all certified stuff, uh, and a lot of this in chronological order. And so when you come to my page, you'll see pictures of the coastline of British Columbia. You'll see a GPS chart showing you where that particular pictures are, set of pictures are taken. It's around 200 pictures on a page. My older stuff, I had 1,000 pictures on a page or more. These are very high-quality pictures, and so let your page load up. And But if well, you scroll to the bottom of it right away, there's a couple of hundred headlines. Can I, can, Dana, yeah, can I tell you started. what I like most about your show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're giving ahead, a great man. synopsis, okay, but let, <laughs> that's good. That's a, good enough. Um, I, you're very positive. You know, you're smiling, and sometimes he pulls out his blues you guitar. Can, yeah, you yeah. can see me smiling even play, though you can't. You can play some uh, some pretty good riffs there, buddy. I've been playing since I was a child, yeah. It's something yeah. I do only for myself. Uh, but I, I've played for over 100, uh, lead guitar for over 100 different people. And so I, I am, I'm good, I'm good playing, uh, fitting in with people for sure. Uh, but it's something I do, I keep my name out of it, keep my face out of it as much as I can, because it's a personal thing with me, and uh, it was a spiritual thing with me, the guitar was. And so I've been at it ever since I was a child. I, like, when I was growing up, of course, there was no, where I grew up, there's still no automobiles. And so we don't have, didn't have cable TV or highways, we didn't have exposure to the outside world, and you didn't have radio, you didn't have that, you, you spend all day talking to people. But I was a man of nature. I grew up as a child in nature and a very unique uh, uh, way to grow up. I can't imagine letting my kid grow up the same way I did, but there you have it. Uh, he's the same as me. In the sense of when I was 13, I had three guns and um, I was throwing off the back of a boat three to 4,000 hooks every morning around 3.34 a.m. and we'll work all day long on the ocean. And that I had my own speedboat and... Uh, oh, Newfoundland, right? Yeah, that was in Newfoundland. And there was no grocery stores in them days. So you shot it. If you didn't shoot it, you couldn't eat. And I, I could never live... I could never do that again. But that was how I grew up. And not that was I was assimilated into that because that was traditional. And you, just these little communities. Uh, and come from a very proud family. Um, when my dad died... We had moved over to the other side of the island. It was over 200 kids had marched in front of his coffin to the graveyard in solidarity because they loved the guy so much. Uh, the whole community filled that church up, never seen it done before, and the graveyard was full. So a very beloved, uh, hard guy. To, to, but I, I was his right-hand man on the back of that boat every morning. 
And so he used to go away and negotiate prices for the East Coast fisheries uh, six days a year uh, as an independent, go up to Ottawa, and he'd come back and he'd be angry and, t- and yelling, not yelling, but talking about it. He never yelled in his life, but talking about it. Uh, and so you're stuck on the boat with him all day long. You can't get away from it. And so he was part of the union for fishermen, so to speak. He was also a guy, you know, let's talk about him for one second, was that that was what inspires me anyway, was uh, it just has to be somebody in your life you have to look up to. Now, we would go travel all around Newfoundland fishing, uh, what, what, the hardest kind of fishing you can imagine, on the back of a boat at 13, throwing thousands of hooks. Every six feet there's a hook, and you're on the North Atlantic, and the average ground swell is 30 feet. And you just go out there, you don't even think about it. Now I couldn't even dream of it, but uh, and I could never do something like that again, but that's what I've done every day for 11 years. Now, we would pull into these communities that were so isolated, and they had no amenities there. And so Dad always had a stack of papers, and he'd go find somebody in the, con- in the community who was a spokesperson, per se, of that community. And I'm not changing the topic or, or digressing or bragging or anything. I just wanted people, because I brought the subject, but I would never bring it up. But I'm very proud of this person, my my dad. He would go into that community and he would find somebody that, you know, was not the, there's no such thing as a mayor in these communities, but somebody that was really popular and well lo- uh, loved and beloved. And he would get his phone number and, and address and stuff like that. And then he would fill out the paperwork. And a year later or so, you get a telephone call or whatever the case may be. And it'd be somebody from a community somewhere around the coastline saying, asking for dad because they wanted to tell him they got a new wharf and they got hydraulics and lights, and they got running water. And this is stuff they never understood, but it just benefited them dramatically every day because they toiled on that ocean. You know, incredible people. I have an uncle. He spent 50 years on the ocean in a little dory by himself and raised nine girls and two boys and can't read or write. But 50 years out there in that little dory in all kinds of weather and making enough money, and they all got an education and got married and have wonderful families and everything else. But it's just this, you know, uh, this integrity that's in you that you can't, you can't turn your back on something when you know it's wrong. And so you, you were raised to do that, and then when you're faced with that challenge, it's a daunting one in this case. Now, I've rose to these challenges many times, and I've never told that story before, but I rose to these challenges many times. And this one, I always have to reflect on what it takes sometimes to get something done and what you got to dedicate. You have to dedicate yourself to it so that if something does happen to you, there's enough people educated um, that that can be carried on, you know, in a proper f- way with a proper narrative and a proper way forward. And so I didn't mean to, to dominate the conversation at the time, but I think it's important that people understand truly what I'm made of and why I do the things I do and why I'm so adamant about the things that are so important to us, but we a lot of people can't really wrap their mind around that. Yeah, no, you you had a very unique upbringing, and yeah. and uh, I've never met anyone from Newfoundland that I didn't like. I'll tell you that. Yeah, much. it's a wonderful place. Uh, there's some good stuff happening there in the eco uh, community world too, which is I think is part of the at least the solution for humans. I'm not sure it's going to help the whales too much, but um, yeah, let's let's try to direct the conversation towards but- solutions now. Right, and uh, just let me finish that off one second. Was sure. That he never stopped until he got that wharf, and that's why we got the phone call at the house. It was because they didn't know what he was up to, but I knew what he was up to, and he didn't stop. And that's why I, I worked alongside of him, and no matter what it was called for all my life, and that's why I do the way I do now. So the solutions, you know, I got a whole whack of solutions for personal, for people themselves for their own life, for their friends, their families, their loved ones, uh, their, their their pets, and anybody that they can touch in a supermarket or anywhere else. It's just simple stuff. And I think as when it comes to solutions, that's all I can offer. I don't know about James. Uh, but uh, an idea that would be, because of what we're talking about, and it's you can't have a conversation about this without sounding salacious, without sounding alarmist without sounding like a fear monger. No, but Dana, I don't want to talk about personal solutions because people can look on the internet and find all sorts of like key. I see. Okay, sure. And all that kind of stuff. I mean, good stuff. I, I, you know, that's, you know, and to me, it, the issue is, is that if we stop don't the stop reactors. this thing, we got to stop the reactors. If we don't stop this thing, you, you said it, and I believe you. The, that's the solution. The planet has a certain lifespan with yeah. this amount of radioactivity because it's stronger than the chemical bond, the nuclear bond, it's going to destroy. It's as you said, it's going to burn up the whole planet. Even if Eventually. we stop, even if we stop the reactor, but we haven't. 
And so that's the focus. Good stuff, you know. And that's what that's what I mean. We gotta we gotta now focus a little bit harder on everybody to perpetrate that out there in the sense of yes, there's major issues and we do and we do we do gotta think about everything and organize everything. But the one thing that we can try to do is stop the reactors. And that's the one thing, and I said that at the very beginning where Harvard and Yale and Stanford and MIT and Oxford and all the major shakers and movers are not there, but they were at Chernobyl. We got to send them all there and because that's the only way we're going to come up with solutions is when they're faced with uh, their own dangers. And so they'll come up with solutions because they have no choice now. And they're the ones that created this mess. They're the ones that got us deep down this rabbit hole with all uh, with yeah, the, the, all they're, the they're, they're not going to do anything. Right, so, and so we got to do it. Throughout history, it has always been, the onus has been on us. And go ahead, James, I'm going to let you go there. Is I agree with what you're saying, but I'm saying that is the only solution, truly, is to force them to go down. You can't do that if you everybody uh, turned on them. Let's, let's talk about solutions a little bit. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the way you shut down a nuclear reaction in a, in a scenario like this, which is not a bomb scenario, uh, it's a it's a, a controlled reaction that's gone un uncontrolled. If you could take uh, the uh, the reason the fuel rods are built the way they are built is because they block the neutrons. So what we have to do is we have to drill down in and start driving uh, panels of the uh, the the same material that you build the rods out of. Uh, and start driving it down into the reaction zone to start uh, uh, eliminating the neutron flux, which is maintaining the reaction. Uh, okay. The other thing we have to do is build a containment vessel around this. Um, and then the uh, uh, right now, 300 tons of radioactive material leak into the uh, groundwater daily at Fukushima. Um, it's contaminated a region around, they estimate, 13,000 square kilometers. Uh, that land has to be basically decontaminated in that you uh, uh, ionically remove the radioactive material from the dirt. And this is a, a very uh, detailed process. It's the equivalent of uh, extracting uranium from uranium-rich soil, for example. Uh, so, uh, then we have to um, uh, maintain this process for probably, uh, literally forever. And, uh, and then the other, um, all of the radioactive waste, we have to remove from that area and take somewhere else so that it um, uh, does not uh, continue to be overheated. So these are all things that, that can be done, have to be done. The, uh, the problem here is that Japan is refusing to act. The, the regulatory commissions and agencies are refusing to act. They're all studying this. Uh, they show pictures of people walking around in white suits uh, like they're studying something. That's homeless, yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, listen, I'm going to – can you – answer these questions for me maybe because these ones trouble me if we built a containment around the plant uh, with the liquefaction that's going on there are already from the from just a site being saturated uh, saturated constantly with water uh, because the detonations went all over the site they bulldozed it down and then they put cement on top of it and everything else but all this water that's coming down from the back mountain see the big problem apparently is that if they contain it, try to contain it, they'll lose the site. And so how do you see your way around that, uh, James? Uh, just curious. Because I, I, I looked at it. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, a problem is that the, the requirement for putting continually putting water on the site to maintain it, to keep it cooled, uh, if you can shut down the reaction right. by driving in, it's the same material you build the rods out of, uh, uh, but but the um, liquid can still get out for a while. Is that what well, you're saying? You, no. What you need what you need is an impregnated uh, rod that you drive down into the ground to block the neutrons. Right, but the water will fill up, and the buildings is liquefaction to the site was what they were saying was the issue. 
So that's all I was I was trying to work out with you, is that if you do that, you have so much radiation boiling back up because what they're allowing this to happen because they don't know any other way to. They say they don't know. They can't come up with enough people to contain it. And recent articles were showing they're running out of workers again. I mean, you're looking at a big job. But So my take on it was the same thing originally, but then I found out that uh, because of liquefaction, because of the stuff oozing back up, because it detonated, went all over the site, and because of all the earthquakes, the, the site is cracked up anyway. They keep putting more uh, pavement on top of it over and over and over, trying to, to get away from the neutron bombardment, I guess, uh, or the x-rays, x-ray bombardment. It, no, what, what you have to do is get down to the, they don't know where the core is right now. Right. They literally don't know where the core is. They have to come in from above. They have to drive materials down in there that will stop the neutrons. From, I got that's that, what, that and, and so once you do that, now you can start cooling the reaction. The reaction will start to subside. And so at that point, you, can, you don't have to keep pouring water on it. This is, for example, say there were not a nuclear accident and you just wanted to decommission the reactor and shut it down. What you would do is you would, uh, it's the same process. You have to stop the neutron flux to stop the reaction. And so that is, uh, once you do that, you don't have to cool the reactor anymore. Well, the then whole site is full of rods that it detonated and went all over the site and they plowed it all into the soil. And so all I'm trying to say is that we have, right, they're splitting the atom everywhere, all over the site itself. So it's not just... Oh, yeah. The, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so... No, it's not... But they building, don't know where... The, there is a core. Building a wall there around is. it. I, I, I'm just trying to pick up what you're saying. I'm, I want to understand that really good. So you build a wall around it uh, with neutron absorption or... Well, uh, it's like, yeah, there's... Hemp, hemp cement is the best known material for absorption of radioactive materials Sweet. for building the wall. Yeah, go figure. Of course it would be, right? Well, well, James, could you not put the wall to in the ocean to ca capture any of the water that's creeping into the ocean and then... I, I've seen, oh, no, you, you, would, you wouldn't sorry, put it in the so ocean. Like, you would... You would put it right up at the edge of the ocean and then yeah. build down. Yeah, yeah, what I mean, but it would capture uh, most of the water that's leaking in now, whether it's being used to cool it or whether it's being, it's coming naturally, you know, uh, you know, off the, uh, you know, off the land uh, as a stream or whatnot. But then uh, you could use zeolite because that was the, the main uh, radiation absorbing material they had at Chernobyl was zeolite. I think the first thing they got to do is transfer all the water from all those tanks to somewhere inland and store it and tear those tanks out of there, tear down all, everything on that site until the only things left are the reactors. And yeah, then you have to, to use get rid robotics. Of the yeah, yeah, they have to get rid of the contaminated water and move it. And there's a, there's a tremendous Right, you got to get that off the site because that has taken up the whole site. And on top of that, it's causing problems throughout the site because hoses and just haywires are everywhere and you can't accomplish anything. And it's just the homeless going in there, the destitute, the, the immigrants who don't speak the language. There's 150 contractors, most of them are the Yakuza's, which is the mob. And so you got to defeat the mob just to get the government to do something because the government is scared to death and in bed with the mob. And, but, I mean, it looks like an international effort has to go in there and take over the country militarily in order to try to save the planet is what we're looking at. They're not going uh, yeah, to do I don't know if it has to be militarily, but... Um, um, they're not going to uh, give it up because they had four years, almost five years to do that. They haven't uh, Japan, invited the planet to come in and help them, right? They don't want to yeah, lose the Olympics in 2020. That's one of the yeah. main reasons. Yeah, they're still... Yeah. They're still killing their own at a phenomenal rate. They're still sending them back into the the, the areas that are are contaminated. I mean, they're get they're they're offering pregnant women free homes. You can't get any more twisted or than that. You can't be any more outside of reality than that. Well, and, if uh, the people go back there, then they can take them off of the uh, payments. Yeah, but I mean, the, it's murder, the evacuation right? Payments. Well, of course. Like, yeah, if I give someone a pill and they die later from it and everybody knew I gave them that pill and knew that I knew it was a bad pill and they died, and that's murder. Or if I shoot them and they died 10 years later, that's still murder. And so what they're doing to people is murder by sending them back in there. And so they're, all I'm trying to establish is that they're so heartless. With, I, I've covered over a thousand headlines on how heartless these people really truly are. 
uh, especially like the hospitals and schools and stuff like that, a shocking disconnect from uh, moral compasses. It's like just not one existing, but there is, you know, lights of hope down there. I I think that the only way that we're going to have a, a debate is if the media comes out and admits it. The media is not going to do it because everything they said becomes a lie and they can't do it. The nuclear industry has to come out and admit it. And then everybody else will be attacking them. It's going to, because what I see is the dead of the Pacific Ocean is the first thing and it's now proven. It's shocking. Just like, uh, you know, eight years ago, I had a company called Marine Channel Productions Limited. And what that was going to do was going to put 100 cameras to start in the ocean. That's when the internet started getting pretty good. And I was going to put 100 cameras in the ocean. And then expand that to thousands of cameras in the ocean of different species, just in British Columbia. Then, but you couldn't do. You couldn't even put a hundred out there now. It would make no sense to do that. And so, to me, you know, because I lived in that environment six hours a day, and I and I have uh, fourteen thousand hours logged. I have another four or five that's not logged, and then I have a dozen commercial boats on this coast alone that I ran on the coastline for up to three hundred and fifteen days a year. I worked boat oceans extensively. It's it's just so shocking because this year I talked to so many fishermen and everybody else, and they say how the fish are not puking up uh, krill or herring or anything or squid, and how the birds have completely disappeared. And asked me, did I think Fukushima had anything to do with it? And you end up having to to sit there and try to have a conversation with these people who have spent twenty or thirty years in telling you, hey, look, you know, thinking you're the bad guy, think you're covering it up. And saying, look, I'm, I know this, I've been out there for 30 years, and, and they're not there, and they call over their buddies from other boats. And I mean, beautiful boats. They've, they've worked those boats for 30 years. they got some serious time put in on that. And everything is where it should be on those boats. And you got to look at them and tell them the truth. It's not easy, but they're already telling it to you. They're saying that's the debt of the Pacific. And, you know, how am I supposed to? It's hard to sleep at night sometimes when I think about this stuff. Because there's so many of them have sent me uh, letters asking me, thinking that I'm the bad guy covering it up, thinking that I'm part of Woods Hole or University of Victoria that is responsible, not understanding, and then finally uh, being able to break through to them and they and they get some answers. And even the people that stop me at the wharfs, you know, and they de- literally demand an answer. And you tell them, yes, there, it is affecting the coastlines. And he says, see, I know it. And he said, everybody around me knows it. So how come you people literally attacking me? I've been vilified. And you, you're trying to break through them that I'm not the bad guy. But that's what they associate now, a researcher. They, like the natives in these little communities along the coastline, you can't, you can't tell them there's no damage. Well, I've I was going to ask you, Dana. Run at me. Dana, run at me. I was going to ask about that. Uh, are the native groups along the coast there, are they not? Uh, complaining to anyone about the fact that, uh, you know... They're freaking out. They can't even go out and get a feed of mussels up north. I went into every one of these little communities, every single one of them, and I'm planning on going back and doing a presentation in each of these communities. But I've talked to the elderly and the young people. I talked to uh, the natives who are fishing, and I've spent time in their communities many times tied up at their wharf and storms. And so they are well aware of it. They, they don't understand what's going on, though. They don't under, they're don't they not able to associate Fukushima or radiation. These are isolated two and 300 people in the community. Hartley Bay, for instance, Metacatla, these little tiny communities, uh, Bella Bella. And they're, uh, they know something is wrong. They can't go out and get the traditional seafood that they would normally go get. You know what, and, Dana? They, they're being told it's because of global warming. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Every one of them says, thank you, Brian, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's what I hear all the time. Global warming, and it's not right, and somebody better do something. And you ask them, uh, when was the last time they were picking mussels? And they'll always say three or four years ago. No matter where you to, they'll say that to you. But I have na- I have um, come up to me and asked me, is, that, is Fukushima water urchins are missing, say, for a house? That, and they shot at me up there with guns to get me at it, or one crew did. Uh, but other natives had, when I ran into them, had asked me that, asked me what I was doing, said I was researching. And he said, do you think that that might have something to do with all the urchins missing on the coastline? But, you know, I, I've been attacked many times on the coastline because people don't understand it. And it never stopped me, but it did scare me. I did get hurt a few times. and But it, it, it worried me many times that uh, 
I was never going to be able to tell the story. And of course, originally, I didn't know what the story was. That's why we went on these expeditions. We covered 9,000 headlines for we headed out there. We knew that was a serious issue and we knew where it would show up. And we couldn't find anybody that went into the tidal pools. So I was like, oh, scoop, I'm gone. I don't know how, but I'm going. And sure enough, uh, it was the most shocking. Even to the very bitter end of 260 days, 15,000 miles of the coastline, when I finally said, okay, I'm done, um, it, was, it was a tough day. Uh, I wanted to go a bit more, but I knew there was no sense in it. I knew that I was just documenting for posterity. Dana, and that it, I don't want to cover more. Uh, go back because yeah, we covered back, yeah. all this great stuff that you've done. Yeah. I really right, appreciate it. I mean, if I got we, a we wouldn't know this stuff. I mean, uh, I saw an article uh, somebody posted on Facebook the other day about uh, they're starting to warn people about a heightened radiation levels in, uh, in Vancouver on the beach. So the, the mainstream is sort of starting to, you know, oh, well, I guess we have to tell something about what's re actually going on. Uh, so that, I'm going to say it peaked and did a good sign. Yeah. But, Go ahead. Yeah. But let, let me throw out some of the ideas. Now, I, like, I just barely had a chance to start digesting this huge document by Gary. Now, I hope I can get Gary Vepperman on. I'd like you uh, guys or one or two of you both to come on with them and, and uh, start going through some of these ideas. I mean... One of the things I've gleaned from reading this document, it's 243 pages, and it's a lot of it is connected to other huge, huge storehouses of information. A lot of the remediation ideas have been repressed by the powers that be, okay, by the media, often usually by the scientific com uh, uh, community. And, and, and again, James knows all about the corruption, so do you. So there's a lot of good ideas out there that we have to bring out, right? And support well, yeah, we have to do this uh, very efficiently. Uh, the other thing, and, and I'm not going to be specific about where I've seen these, but um, unfortunately there's a lot of um, you know, what you might call ideas that really don't have any scientific merit at all. Uh, well, that's and the thing. I mean, I, that's, we, that's we can't go down a lot of rabbit holes, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, what? Uh, about, okay. I just want to. This is why I want you, uh, if you could have the time, James, to get involved in this big, uh, like it's called a uh, what do they call it? A literature uh, a review or research or analysis. Have you heard of Brown's gas being used to limit radiation? Well, there again. <laughs> Uh, radiation is radiation. It doesn't go away. It doesn't disappear. You have to contain it. You have to, uh, you have to get it in a spot, and, and when it's mixed with other stuff, you have to take that other stuff along with the radiation and, and isolate it and just get it far away from everything else uh, and, and contain it so it doesn't get out of there. Uh, you have to, and the first part of this is you have to stop the neutron flux which is maintaining the reaction. Mm -hmm. if, if, if that's stopped, now you just have contaminated material that's like, uh, it's like uranium ore sitting out there. It's just there, it's inert. It's not, it's not ready to uh, decompose radioactive so, into other radioactive components. So you don't believe there's any sort of energy beam or uh, like a gamma beam or something no. that could be put no. on it to, to get it to cool off by itself? No. You don't think that those technologies are real. You think they're just ideas. They're just ideas. Yeah. If you, you have to understand what nuclear reaction, these are unstable nuclei. If you start breaking them apart, you're going to get a lot more energy out. And so uh, what we've got is a monster. You've, you've created a monster. And you have to get it into some containment zone and that zone will never be a uh, useful again it's like iraq it's destroyed um it's like uh, uh you know the the fact that that japan just powered up 48 other reactors shows the absolute insanity there's over 700 nuclear reactors in the world there's over 100 in the united states that that should be decommissioned uh the san onofre uh nuclear reactor in san diego no, uh, was leaking. They had a, actually had an accident there that they covered up, 
and it's going to take $5 billion to decommission that plant. That's an estimated, I, I would estimate it's probably going to take double that, but they didn't want to tell the public who's going to have to pay that bill for a, a, a very new reactor that is, uh, is worthless, it's a piece of junk. But the world has a severe problem. It cannot continue using nuclear fuel. Uh, Germany um, shut down all their nuclear reactors, a cutter, uh, uh, while other countries are building reactors. Well, twenty twenty is their deadline, I think. Eh, I think I don't think they shut them all down yet, James. But the deadline is twenty twenty. Yeah. Or Germany? Yeah, yeah. I think that they've got till twenty twenty to shut them all down. I, I'm not sure. It's a good deadline. I mean, it's got it's a hell of a lot better than Japan. Um, and there, I, I I was reading too that the the Canadian government's agreed to bring a lot of the nuclear waste back to Canada to store it if they were going to use our fuel to to run their reactors. And I was checking out the uh, the Russian site. Man, they're they're pumping nuclear power. They're promoting it through their uh, big company. Uh, it starts with an R, Rosnan or something. Uh, so it, yeah, this oh man, it's sickening that people uh, actually still want to use that stuff. But but no, they. Uh, I I don't want to uh, waste my time or, uh, and it's not a waste of time. But like I said, I don't want to uh, jump in into a lot of rabbit holes, uh, chasing things that uh, really don't make sense by people who are not scientists uh, no, but, that understand uh, the real issues. Yeah. But James, a lot of these people in this document that I've read are scientists. People who have had scientific foundations, and they—they they are, you know, they're, like they're into prime numbers and all that same kind of stuff that you're into. I mean, they—they they, they do. They are serious. They spent their whole life being scientists, and they, and a lot of them were alternative scientists. They weren't like mainstream, like uh, like you. So I think there are some people in there that are worth uh, reading, uh, reading their uh, their material. So uh, I think it it is worthy of a review to look at this document. Uh, I, I, I'll just throw stuff at you as I go through it, and you can give me your opinion. I don't know if you'll have time, but i got to find someone to work with. And I think Dana is a good guy because Dana knows more about this stuff than I do. But we got to we've got to ferret out the good ideas from this huge document. There's got to be some good ones in there. Um, yeah, but did you hear what I said originally? Uh, to uh, it's it's known how to shut down a nuclear reaction. We know how to do that. Yeah. Yeah, they have to. They have to probe down in from above, and they have to drive down in the neutron absorbers to shut this reaction down. They have to contain the water from leaching into the ocean. That we know is happening. Uh, they have to, once they contain the reaction and shut it down. Now we're just left with a big contamination problem. Um, but they got to shut that reactor down. The one that's still burning. Well, it's. Uh, I think it's. Uh, how many reactors? Uh, Dana, we think. You think we, we, think we think there's four burning down there, just in Fukushima. We think there's four in the Downey area, and we think there's probably another six or seven along the coastline that melted down. That's from the headlines and the documentation we got from 2011, showing huge radiation spikes in these areas. Uh, that, but, but we know these plants were inundated with the tsunami. We know they lost their cooling just like Fukushima. We know they had explosions and fires just like Fukushima. And we know that they, were, they, they wouldn't emit Fukushima only in certain parts of the world was emitting it. But here in North America, I mean, we couldn't even find pictures originally of all four reactors when we started looking at it. It was almost impossible to find a true picture. That's why you ended up with 5,000 of them. Most of those from TEPCO's website. And I got them by typing in, going to the URLs and typing in extra letters and numbers. <laughs> yeah. I found let, let, me say, sorry, let me say something about the tsunami. Uh, the, if you look at the, at the reactors at Fukushima, right. there is a warehouse between the reactors and the ocean. The warehouse, is, fuel pool. Yeah. The, the, the warehouse is completely untouched. I don't know how a tsunami could come in and get to the reactors and do the damage that it did. I got the that pictures warehouse. of the tsunami, dear. Yeah. But, I got but the pictures the, of it from the roof, from the workers that took pictures. Uh, but, yeah, there are buildings that stayed intact. There's no doubt about it. 
And it was like that throughout the country where there was buildings. There was 2,000 square miles of it washed away uh, on both sides of Fukushima because it was right off that prefecture. The tsunami, uh, when you added it all up, was close to 500 miles. But 350 miles or so, you can find the footage up on YouTube in detail of how bad those communities were ripped apart where the nuclear plants were. And so there was a lot of documentation. They lost the infrastructure to all the power plants along that coastline. Not all of them, but the majority of them, particularly where the tsunami turned everything into a wood chipper. And so they weren't able to get power in there. They weren't able to get cooling into the pools. We got the releases, over 4 million emails, and a lot of it's redacted about that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's definitely shown it wasn't just Fukushima. But Fukushima, is, like you say, is the one we, we were stuck with we can talk about for most people. I do talk about it, the other ones. And that that... That is most likely what we're looking at is why the Pacific died the way it did so quick and why everything is on its way down from here on out and why the mass uh, die-offs right away were so, because there was so much released at the one time originally. The original releases were vicious. There was a plume going right across the entire Pacific Ocean to North America and covering North America and most of uh, South America Within 10 days, that plume was stretched the entire way across. It didn't stop. It's still like that, except it's not. It doesn't have those big volumes of the original releases. But there, there is a huge. Uh, I mean, they're still finding iodine in Tokyo drinking water that just came out uh, today or yesterday. Uh, but we got so much on how much went throughout the entire country. It was hard to explain it with just uh, the reactors in Fukushima. When I started looking at the tsunami, a disaster along the coastline, and looking for where reactors were, you were able to postulate, and then you were able to find the headlines to support they had issues and that they were most likely meltdowns too. Certainly, I look at at least 14 meltdowns on the coastline of Japan. If you look at the data, that's what you end up with. And certainly, uh, that would explain why we're in the trouble we're in so fast. Who, would have, who could have thought you could kill the Pacific, let alone in four and a half years? Uh, well, we have study uh, after study. Go ahead, James. Yeah, the, 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 when you look at the, the, the shorter term uh, reactives um, like cesium and strontium and the fact that they directly attack larger biological systems like fish and whales and mammals and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the mollusks and the sea urchins and the, uh, they will kill them directly. It, it's not a matter of cancer. It's a, not a matter of eating ph phytoplankton. It's a matter that they will kill them immediately within days. And so... Uh, uh, yeah, we got, uh, we got those studies showing that along the coast. Yeah, and, and that, oh, that is, so your studies are showing directly that, that those elements have gotten into, the, into those areas and... Uh, you know, this is, this is a disaster. Uh, we always worried about nuclear war. This is as, at least as bad as any nuclear war that you could ever imagine. What's bad about it also is that the scientific community related to the energy industry is mum in covering it up. The governments are covering it up. You have incompetent people like Obama who didn't do anything. Uh, there were agencies from like Norway companies that were, uh, had the ability to go in and shut this down and clean it up right away, and nobody let them in there. So this was more than just uh, ignorance and, and incompetence. This was a direct uh, a prohibition of companies being allowed to go in there and clean this up and shut it down. But um, what do we do now? The, it has to be shut down. It has to be contained. And then the residuals, it's hard to say uh, where this will go. Uh, the Hawaiian Islands, for example, um, or whether this will eventually come around in, this, in the ocean circuits to affect Australia, New Zealand, uh, work around through the Indian Ocean and up into the Atlantic. James, I like your suggestion. Circuit. I'm going to cut you off. I like your suggestion by putting those uh, uh, panels down or rods down. How close would you have to get to the reactors uh, well, you just you just keep driving them in until you get it uh, into the reactor core. Okay. Uh, and Sweet. you you have to have probes that go down in there. Point uh, J yeah, Japan has done nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, in the, and there's as far as the nuclear regulatory agencies, they've done nothing. 
so uh, it's like there are these issues like draining the lake at Yellowstone. These, uh, we have completely incompetent geologists working for the government. Uh, you know, the, the level of incompetence and ignorance and stupidity and um, blatant criminal activity in the scientific community, uh, you know, we might spend the next 50 years trying and, and putting these people in prison. Uh, but right stop now... The reactors first. So I like your idea. It makes sense to me, that's for sure. Yeah. I'll advocate it for sure. Uh, can you tell us any more about that? Like, I know the rods are all over the site, but you're not worried about that. You're worried about the chain reaction only. And my apologies for not catching on to that one quick enough. But uh, I'd like you to try to explain to people, and myself included, uh, how long do you think something like that would take? How many people do you think that would take? What kind of a uh, timetable should that be done in? Any kind Is there of a company now, James, that could do this kind of work? Uh, 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 all I can say is that if I if I were given the resources, I'd have it done uh, pronto. I mean, this is not rocket science. The right. the materials to absorb neutrons are well known. You just start driving them down into the reaction zone, and as they absorb neutrons, it starts naturally cooling down and and uh, shutting down that reaction. And this is going to be a process that you. What's the metal they uh, use? No, the the in a reactor, it's heavy water. Uh, the 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 rods themselves are transparent to neutrons, yeah. and the reason that the rods become spent is because the material becomes opaque to neutrons with time. That's why you have to decommission. It's not because the nuclear fuel has been used up. If the nuclear fuel had been used up, we wouldn't have this problem. Uh, but the the nuclear fuel is not used up, and the um, the the rod material becomes opaque to the neutrons. And so um, it, it shuts down, the, it's, they, they're no longer usable. So they take the rods out and store them, but there's enough activity where they remain hot and so they what, have to be cooled for yeah, a long period well, of time. Great start. So, what, what, what I'm telling you is, made out of, what I'm telling you is that the heavy water is what shuts down, which uh, that's what absorbs the neutrons. So you, you bring the rods out of the water and drop them down into the water to control the reaction. That's the way it's always Norm, been done. Norm, yeah. Yeah. So in, in so Chernobyl, they we'll used boric acid and dropped lead down on it for 10 days. But uh, 600 of those helicopter pilots, they all died from radiation illnesses. I was wondering if that might have had something to do with stopping that chain reaction down there. They say it didn't, but I'm of second thoughts about it because that was what they were trying to do. Basically, is what you're saying, just dumping it down on top of it, hoping enough of it would find its way down there and, and create that effect. And so uh, that's literally the China syndrome where it just keeps going down and down and down until it, you know, it, it, it meets a material that's as hot as it is. And that's where it stays. Right. Um, uh, but in, in, uh, Fukushima, we have another problem. It's got the ocean right there and this is leaching into the ocean. Uh, so that's why it has to be shut down and then, and then at the same time contained. At least shutting down. The contain is like at this stage. I'm not even thinking about the containment. I'm just like we got to stop the reactors. Then we can deal with everything else. No problem. Like you're saying, exactly like you're saying. And so you're. I can. I can understand your frustration now, of uh, because you understand that that's what they all should have went and done anyway. That would have been a normal reaction, you, according to, you know how you put it, how eloquent you you were able to say it. And so your take on it was because of the corruption and everything else, but that is ultimately what they're going to have to do if they want to try to deal with it. Yeah, well, you have to sidestep the government, the, the scientific community, the regulatory commissions, uh, the United Nations. Uh, these are all corrupt agencies. And uh, uh, there's a lot of other things going on in the world today where people simply are sidestepping the normal, you'd say, well, let's take them to court. No, <laughs> you'd be 20 years right. in the court no. system that was... I agree uh, with you. Uh, we got to go We got to go. Go to battle. Uh, estimates were looking at 6 million people would be sacrificed to stop these things. What you're suggesting is a much better <laughs> way around it than throwing bodies at it, because that's what they've done at Chernobyl. But they also dumped everything on top of it. And, and I, when I look at it all, I always thought that's what stopped the chain reaction. And 600 helicopter pilots were, were one of the big sacrifices for that. And so 
it's the same thing we're looking at here in one sense where we might see something like that happen. It's a lot better than throwing millions of people at it and having billions dying because of it. You can't even change that part of it. When you look at the actual what happened, everybody in North America was breeding five or 10 or 100 hot particles a day. And that's why we had spikes of heart attacks from the cesium, like you were saying. But everything that was in the reactors was uh, plutonium in all four of those reactors, and that in particular in Fukushima. Uh, and there was 22,000 spikes of heart attacks for a couple of months. That was an abnormality. And you, you, and you were talking about how that affects, it wasn't just a marine life, of course. Everything comes into the mountain, hits the mountain, washes back down to the coastline. So they were getting hammered. And, you know, as a commercial diver, when I swam along the coastline, I used to get towed along in a boat. You get all this fresh water building up along the shoreline. Very hard to see in the first couple of feet. You got to poke your head way down. And so that's why the low tide zones were getting pummeled. Because the first foot or two foot during rainy seasons was full of radionuclides of that ocean water from the runoffs on top of that. Um, well, just guys, just I want to throw a question in here because we're getting near the end. I just uh, something that's been uh, bugging me. And I wanted to ask this question: Should we be evacuating the whole coastline of North America? You mean the West Coast? Yeah. Um. I don't know. It's that dangerous, or do you think that with... I, uh, I don't they know. evacuated the Chechen River, 7,500 communities in the 50s, permanently, 9,000 square uh, miles. Still evacuated. We need, we need data. What we don't have is data. Um, and we do the, have the data, government. Uh, James, we do have the, the, the actual numbers, but I hear what you're saying. Uh, go ahead, James. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go uh, what ahead, I'm James. talking about is actual measurement of cesium, strontium, iodine, those are the traces. Uh, and there's 2,000 more, but those are the traces that you look for. Um, and uh, those are the most dangerous ones relative to immediate death. The other ones are like uh, 5, 10, 15 year cancer. Uh, also the, lethal. The studies on, I got, uh, shows curium was one of the bigger, and krypton. Uh -huh. or oh, yeah, there's two, two there's the big a long concerns. list. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah, there. Like you said, two thousand. But uh, the the ones I, I see the studies on the data. dogs was curium. It, it was just like plutonium or americium. Go. Ahead. I'm sorry, James. Go ahead. But we need data. We need right. data from real scientists that aren't paid liars. Right. You got the original uh, data. Is that how? Uh, like the original data was shown twenty million becquerels of iodine, one hundred thirty one in a liter of rainwater. That's from Simon Fraser University. Uh, just after. You know, one of the first major rainfalls. And, of course, rain don't fall by the liter, but 10 times more 132 we know is going to be in that because of the ratio that was created down there from other studies from Japan. There was 31, 30 times more 133 iodine along with that 20 million 131. And there's 31 times more iodine 129 that was created in the chain reaction. It's just like you, like you say, you can extrapolate uh, from the heavy departures to dispositions that are already, because that doesn't disappear, doesn't turn, like you said, it doesn't turn to fairy dust. Um, and so that's a start, in other words, was what I'm saying. We got a, a really big numbers for the whole coastline. Now we got the other uh, studies showing a million becquels a square meter in North America disposition. And so that's like over the top crazy, ludicrous stuff. Yes, in every sense yes of the absolutely. Word. Yeah. Well, that's yeah and that's one thing I was reporting on when uh, the year after Fukushima. Uh, that the uh, jet stream was uh, bringing it up, bringing it up, uh, and coming down in the snow, in the right. snow melt, and then you has get more that. parts on them, right? More points, so it aggregates uh, even more. It's yeah, uh, and so anyway, no, North America has been just pummeled with this radiation, and there's nobody talking about it, um, and there's no measurement. So it's in the, it's in the crops, it's in the ground. Uh, basically, it's been polluted. They've measured it in Europe. Certainly, it's passed over the United States and into Europe. So this is all over the place, um, in rainwater and snow, etc. James, but let me cut. Let me cut you off, James. Listen, you know, I I listen. I got seven thousand lectures, and I listen to everybody out there that talks about Fukushima. But I've never heard anybody as good as you. I haven't heard anybody as straight up as you, and I haven't heard anybody as honest and sincere as you, as eloquent as you. And I'd just like to say right away, and before I forget to say that, how how privileged I am, I feel, tonight to be able to chat with you and understand that there are people out there that are way out of my league and are so astute 
And uh, that's the kind of people I need to see show up to give me some confidence with what you've done tonight. And I know I'm hard to take sometimes because I'm a very skeptical person, but you got through to me tonight, no problem. I uh, got you loud and clear. And I would love to hear you over and over and over in the future. Is there any sites out there I can recommend to people, James, where they can find any of your, if you got um, any conversations uh, on this out there people can go listen to? Well, my web page uh, is the jmccsci.com, and that's where I concentrate my materials, so that's the place to go. Uh, it's over six gigabytes on that site. So Can you do that again for me? Can you do that one more time for me? J Seven letters, J-M-C-C, S as in Sam, C as in Charlie, I as in Indigo.com. Okay, gotcha. Good stuff. You, you could have him as a guest on your show, too. Dave. I will so. As soon as I get to Skype, if James is up to it, we would be privileged to have someone like him on our show, absolutely, as many sure. times as he was like. Um, so, 